Hello there. Welcome to the inevitable Motor Trends series on the future of mobility, or as Johnny likes to say, the future of the car. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? These are the topics. Uh, is, it, is it inevitable that electric vehicles are in everyone's future? And after that, what comes next? Connected cars, cars that drive themselves. Who knows? We don't. We're going to try to find out. <laughs> My co-host is the legendary, infamous Johnny Lieberman. I like infamous. That's Inf- good. Infamous yeah. is a good one. It is very true, very accurate. Yeah. I've been there for many, many times. Um, <laughs> And we have a great guest. We have a great guest today that kind of is, uh, uh, oh boy, be super oh girl, corny. oh girl, oh girl. Yeah. the yin to our yang, you yes. might say. Yeah, that's uh, a good way to put it. Yeah. Very uh, different perspective, I th- we think. She's in the industry, but she's, you know, as Johnny said, she's a she. Uh, she's younger than us by at least 10 years. I don't know, oh, it's way more than Maybe 10 years. 15 yeah, yeah, years, yeah, yeah. which don't, makes don't me want to cry, yeah, yeah. Uh, which kind of brings us to the topic of the well, day. She has a name. She has a name. Sorry, yes. Our, our, our guest, Kristen Lee. Well, we can we can get there on that. But uh, yes, Kristen Lee, automotive journalist, uh, currently at uh, The Drive, formerly of sites including Jalopnik, Road and & Track, and Business Insider. Yeah, so she's well-rounded. She's been around. Been around. Yeah. Um, I'm really looking forward to meeting her because I've actually never met her before. I've which heard is, a lot about her. Which is crazy. Which yeah. is crazy. She also uh, did us a solid and was on our Motor Trend show, uh, Shift Talkers. Yes. And, I think uh, she beat me twice. She beat Johnny yeah. twice, which is... Uh, I, although I think beating me became part of the theme of the show. They, they liked how upset I got when I lost. After clearly winning, they would be like, you're the loser. Right. Well, we can talk about <clears throat> That's that. That's something else. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. But yes, we, I have her uh, on... Uh, I a uh, terrible ask of her like to speak on behalf of her, her you know her gender her race uh, the youth of America right. uh, as we transition into uh, our inevitable future but you bring up a great point and uh are we too old man let me let me set this up so right. this morning before I got here I need to get a new car and um I was looking at Lexus GXs because they actually you know look it's a little baby Land Ro- or Land Cruiser uh they're actually not as expensive as you might think mm-hmm. um and I'm like you know before we you know inevitably go all electric maybe I need one last V8 but am I just a gross dinosaur pig in that is there an entire generation of, of, of people that are like, V8, you monster. Right. You forest-destroying, climate-changing monster. How could you do that good conscience? Get right. an EV. And that right. could be my wife talking. But, you know. <laughs> um, well, so buy yeah. or lease? What's that? Are we going to buy or lease? Um, I think in this case, lease to buy. Because okay. just the way my, my finances are set up, uh, I, I, it makes more sense to lease. But at the end of the lease, I think I buy. Because I think this might be my forever Kind of car. Well, I was going to say, so you know, the thing about, as you know, about Land Cruiser, so the Land yeah. Cruiser owner, you know, the GX is essentially the Land Cruiser Prado, Prado, Prado. you know, yeah. it, which is the architecture the Forerunner was sort of based on. Sort of, no, it's much more Land Cruiser than Forerunner, right? Yeah. But this is, this is uh, at this point, it's it's fairly it's, it's fairly old. The GX has been oh, around. Oh, it's ancient. Uh, Twelve years. This is right. the twelfth model year, and, th- and and they didn't really change it that much from the previous one. And it's going to last two hundred years at so, least. So if you buy one and never get rid of and it, and never get rid of, it. I'm saying like it, this is this again. We're going to go down this path. Is are we too old? Like you, you and I, are roughly, we're very close in age. Um, we're the same age. We're the same age. Yeah. Old. You could. This could be, and we're talking about the original concept behind the inevitable is what's fifteen years in the future. This thing will easily last fifteen years in the future. Easy, it'll go twenty. Years. You, I'm not yeah. so sure about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Thank no, you. I mean, fifteen years in the future. We'll, <laughs> right. In all seriousness, we'll, we'll both be looking down the barrel at probably, hopefully, God, hopefully, retiring. Right? I mean, fifteen years. I'd like. To, I got another twenty in me. I think. Another okay, 20. but I mean, yeah, yeah. It's actually close to the mandatory retirement age for for certain companies. Yeah, 50, between fifteen and twenty years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is it is true. Like when we when we talk about this, um, this the inevitability. Like you and I, we can we could ride this rest of the thing out and only drive internal combustion. Engines. Sure, they'll be around. Sure, it, it, this, they'll definitely be around in the used market, second secondary market. Yeah, and you know, in the U.S., we're never going to actually mandate you can't buy something. Right. right. I mean, you know, we, you can buy whatever you want in this country. Right. You until, know, so. and, you know, they, it, until uh, they're just not available for, for other reasons. Yes. You, yeah, yeah. I, I always said that. Like, you know, when Gavin Newsom said, by 2035, there'll be no internal combustion cars available in California. I'm like, that's the weakest thing ever because, like, there won't be any for sale by then. You know, right. like, everything's just going to be in an EV. An electrified car, a yeah. hybrid car, or, yeah. a, pure, or a, fuel, a full battery electric. Yeah. But 
yeah, I think this is a good topic just to to talk about as we set up for Kristen coming online because she uh, has hopefully, I mean, I, I assume a different perspective um, because of some research that we'll get into that I've that I that we actually commissioned in uh, in trying to understand the car shopper about where where people's heads are at from a general perspective, like you know the dealer experience buying sure. a car, but also specifically around EVs. And I'll be honest, and again, we'll talk about it with her. It kind of blew my mind because it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily track with me. Like I don't, I don't think about vehicle ownership or EV ownership from necessarily this perspective. Like for me, I mean, mine is a very. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. My interests are very narrow. It's like I, yes, I have some interest in it from an environmental perspective. Honestly, it's it's more about I'm just curious. I love cars. I want to know what this is about. And then professionally, I need to know what it's about. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, there's plenty of dinosaurs in our um, in our industry. Uh, I don't think anybody is actively resisting that or, or thinking that EVs aren't coming. But there are certainly a range of opinions in terms of whether they're any good, whether they're sexy, whether they're something that they would, sure. they would Look, want to Sure. Look, the, the classic one is you know, it doesn't have a soul, which is like, oh, your Corolla has a soul. Right. It doesn't make good the noises. It's yeah. oh, boring, no noise. terrible. Like, really, you really want that droning in your ears. I, mean, I, can, I can refute these. But, and there's all, you know, and look, and there is some truth to this next part is that, you know, environmentally speaking, if you are burning coal to not only power them, but also to, you know, make the batteries in Chinese factories, uh, you know, it might actually be worse for the environment initially than an internal combustion car that's not made using coal to produce the right. thing. Now, eventually, the EV will be cleaner, uh, you know, just because they're more efficient is, is why. Right. Um, but you might, you know, it depends on which study you read. You might have to drive, you know, 70,000 kilometers, 40,000 miles to, to make the EV cleaner. It still is cleaner. Right. But anyway, so that, that's Well, legit. but then the true, the true mind-warping part of that is that's only if you're talking about buying, considering purchasing a new gas-powered vehicle versus a new battery sure. electric vehicle. Sure, 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 sure. If you want to, to upend the entire Apple Card in our, in our business model – you shouldn't even be considering buying a new car, oh, right? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Used cars, <laughs> yeah. This, yeah, environmentally, the car, from a carbon uh, carbon capture standpoint, it's a sunk cost, right? right. Things already been produced, right, right, right. Like, you're not, you're not, you're not buying a new one. That well, back to my GX, though, like that tooling has been around for at sure, least right, twelve right, years. Right, right, exactly, <laughs> so, right. hey, good, good segue. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to like explain that one to my wife, who's gonna be like, "Are you nuts?" Right. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, do you feel? Outside of your design, so actually, we should dig in. Why specifically? I get why a GX. The yeah. size is right. It's yeah. three row. It's 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 sort of a. It's actually more compact than a lot of three row SUVs. It is, and it's the super three capable. row actually has nothing. To do. I, in fact, I I prefer if it was a two row. I'll never need a third row. Hmm, okay. I don't think, but um, no. Look, I have um, you know. Do you just want to be more... naturally aspirated V eight? There's that. I don't even care about the V eight part. I, you know, and honestly, if like if the Rivian. Uh, Oh, nice. uh, yeah, it was available now. I might m- might do that, but I j- you know I just have really gotten into off roading. Hmm. I really enjoy it, and I I can get a press car whenever. I got a Jeep Rubicon plugged in. You know, it's a four XE yeah. downstairs, right below where we're sitting now. The thing is, inevitably, if you really go real off roading, you do a little scratchy scratch, right? Mm-hmm. All the cars get a little scratched up, and, and it's I'm a press just, car, perfect. It's a press car, but. <laughs> You still got to make that phone call. Hey, man, uh, everything's fine. Nothing's broken. But, yeah, I, I, I scraped that one part. And, like, they're, they're always so polite. But, you know, I want my own. Okay. Uh, and I just I – just, just, I can just – I don't have to worry about that. I can, I, can, I can play with it. I can modify it. It's weirdly responsible. Yeah, I'm getting old. Okay. <laughs> so, well, I don't know. You're kind of upending this whole argument then because you could, you could get a – you know, you don't have to get a V8 uh, off-roader. You could get – uh, you can get any number of you can get a four cylinder no, Tacoma pickup I, truck. I, I agree. Yeah, as a, but as a four by four, I, I agree. There's just, there's you know look. The longer I've done this, there's, there's three vehicles that you know, off road that really excite me. There's there's the Wrangler, which does really excite me, and I am I am thinking about the three ninety two. Really excited to me. There is uh, the the, the Land Cruiser. No 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 off road off road. Okay. There's the Land Cruiser slash GX LX family and there's the G Wagon. I can't afford a G Wagon, a new one. I want to I, I would I do want to buy something new. I'm a big believer in buying new cars okay. for a lot of reasons. Um can't afford a G Wagon. 
I do like the Jeep a lot. Just if you don't get the 392 um, for the money, you know, like like the middle level GX starts at like 56, and like you know, a Wrangler Rubicon is is more than that, right? Yeah, four by E, I think uh, the one the I one drove, I have 68, 68. Yeah, yeah. we think they're the same one. So like, boy, and there's you know, it's it's a Toyota, so there's not a lot of options. There really aren't, right. you know. So it's like it's kind of like the, the cheapest thing to get for that awesome. level of off road ability. Yeah, you can get a Jeep Sahara or whatever for less, but I want I want the Rubicon level, um, and uh, yeah, your so, Grand Cherokee. Yeah, yeah, the Grand Cherokee's good, but again, there's no there's no EV option on that, and I know there's none on the GX, but I just. I just feel that the there the, is an EV there, no there's a there's a Grand Cherokee four by E yeah for, that the plug-in hybrid's not for me it's not the way okay. to go yeah but uh, yeah so I want that solid axle thing which Grand Cherokee doesn't have Defender doesn't have uh, G Wagon has GX LX Land Cruiser which is out of production has and the Jeep has the the Wrangler so uh, I, I want that extra ability I, I like that in, in an off roader so I'm I don't, that's kind of why I'm leaning that way. But we'll see. We'll see. So if you end up getting- also real quick, I drive my personal car maybe 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 three thousand miles a year, probably closer to one thousand okay. two thousand miles a year. Right. So so this could be the last car you ever purchase new. Right? If you the, the, if you did lease to own, this would be my <laughs> could be my well. I mean, hopefully uh, <clears throat> I'm very successful in the upcoming years and I can have ten cars. But yeah, right. this is this would be but this would be my forever off roader, kind of like your Land Cruiser. Right. Yeah. Well, again, I, I'm a uh, world's cheapest uh, automotive journalist. I buy a lot of cars used. And, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're uh, and this one is uh, yeah, it's a classic, and I'm glad to see yeah. that it's appreciated. But let's get back to whether we're too old. Yes. I, I mean, outside of your personal interest in vehicles, like, do you feel like, I, I, again, we're going to talk to somebody with a, a fresh perspective on the industry, on, on the car business. Is this something you struggle with? Like, you you have to, like, restrain yourself or break your break yourself out of some mindset when you're either looking at new cars or what's coming or do you generally feel like you're pretty open minded about stuff? Or? I think I'm pretty open minded. Like if you if you looked at the list of, of cars that I've you know I'm considering buying to replace this Ford that blew up. I mean it was everything from a Veloster N to I put G T three on there. My wife quickly crossed it out, but Veloster N to, you know, the, the Lexus G X. Like I'm all over the map. Um I Weirdly, it was my wife. Any said, EVs on there? Yeah, yeah. That the uh, the the Hyundai Ionic Five is on there, although I don't really know much about it. Okay. Um, uh, the Rivian, depending on when we buy the the the, the R One S, right? They got to work on their names, man. R One S, because uh, I love the truck. I don't need a pickup truck. I, I just I, I I don't I don't want a pickup truck. What about a seventy thousand dollar Lucid? Um. Well, so my wife said, she goes, maybe we don't want two sedans. That was actually her idea. She said, if we already have, you know, the Julia, do, you know, because I, I had Civic Type R on there. That was, that was going to be, you know, like no brainer. Right. And she's like, ah, two four doors? Like, yeah, let's maybe maybe a truck. And, and she, for some reason, was really hot on the Ford Maverick, which I love. But again, right. I just don't need a pickup truck. So that Bronco yeah. Sports on the list, the two liter. Um, so yeah, I'm all over the map. I'm, yeah. I'm all over, uh, and so I, I feel like I am pretty open minded uh, when it comes to vehicles. I just you know look, I just want a GT3, and I can't afford it. So right. that's what it comes down to. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about this whole this whole the whole uh, setup for this, and uh, how awful it is to somebody who is maybe our age or older. And we should I should clarify that eh, numeric your n- numeric age is one thing. I guess we're talking about a mindset more than anything, right? Like how receptive are you? Uh, you listening? Uh, how receptive are we to this coming uh, moment in in automotive, where things are? I mean, they're transitioning so fast. Like I can remember an era where there was one hybrid or no hybrids, yeah, and then one or, and then one or two, yeah, uh, one. There was one. Well, there's yeah. a actually people forget. The, oh, that, right, that, right. The tadpole shaped Honda Insight came right. out before. Which had a manual. That's right. Yes, it, did. Yeah, it was yeah, awesome. Yeah, and then it became really big in the cool. import drag racing scene because it was so light. <laughs> but um, that's true. You know, we lived through this that <laughs> transition, and that actually felt. In comparison, relatively slow. For a while, it was like Insight, and then that went away, and then it was like Prius only. And it was just Prius, just yeah. Just for a long time. Yeah, and then yeah, Bolt yeah. came online, and other folks, Hyundai started doing their own their own. But line. now the floodgates are opening. Are opening so fast on EVs. Yeah. and um, I mean, you know, keep talking about Jeep. Like, I have a Jeep plugged in, which to me is still crazy, and Stellantis is going all in. I sure. Mean, they're, they're going nuts, they're nuts, you know, right. which, is, which is great, but it's like it's fast, you know. Right, so. right. So – Look, I feel like we are again this floodgate of EVs that are that are coming. It's super exciting. It's driving 
uh, a lot of traffic to our site. People are actively looking <laughs> yeah, for yeah, yeah. all the stories that we have, which which I'm not just talking about, like to say go to motortrend.com. Go to well, motortrend.com. Yeah, but go to motortrend.com slash the inevitable. Like it's not just it's not just <laughs> that. Like it, yeah. truly, um, I've, I've mentioned this before. Like we have seen an uptick. We've seen a strong signal from our audience online. Uh, that they're interested in EVs, specifically EVs other than Tesla. Again, f- since t- 2011, 2012, the only stories that did any any traffic, any reasonable interest on our site was something involving Tesla. Starting around 2019, changed. Every, changed. Yeah, I did. think uh, yeah. Lightning, Ford F-150 Lightning was, was a top story last year. Uh, yeah, we talked about Riv- this, but Lucid, Riv- Lucid Air, Rivian. Rivian. Yeah. It helps that <clears throat> we got a bunch of exclusives. Well, sure. <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, there was a three-week period, I believe, where I was the only human on the planet that had driven the Lucid Air and the Rivian R1T. Right. It, it didn't last long, but it was kind of neat. But, th- but yeah, and that and that speaks to us having. Thank you very much, Johnny, because that helps that helps get us uh, the eyeballs on our stories. But fundamentally, most of our traffic, seventy percent roughly, comes from search engines. That means yeah. people actively looking for. These vehicles looking for what should I buy it? Like the good and the bad, the pro and the con. And I'm going to hazard a guess that it's it's mostly young people because it's still young people that drive uh, that drive clicks and views online. That said, though, older people, as we know this, buy more cars now. That yes. those, those younger people are getting older, and and it's so funny being Gen X that like you know uh, the the millennials are. They're no longer the kids. There's Gen Z that oh, yeah. are in the workplace oh, yeah. and buying stuff and yeah. having thoughts, and it's it's bizarre. You know, right. opinions that that count. You can't just dismiss them as like you know high school kids anymore. They're actually like purchasing things. And that's, what a great segue because you know speaking of Gen Z or Gen, uh, is she a millennial Gen Z? I don't oh, even she's know. Right on the cusp. Right on the yeah, cusp. Yeah, yeah. But with opinions that count. Yeah. Let's bring on our guest for today, Kristen Lee, automotive journalist, currently at. The drive. So, uh, welcome to the inevitable and our first Zoom guest, Kristen Lee, a journalist currently with The Drive, deputy editor at The Drive, formerly of various well known outlets, including Jalopnik, Road and Track, and Business Insider. Johnny and you are well familiar, done a lot of different, I think, podcasts and Shift Talker episodes together. This is my first time. Meeting you, albeit virtually, we were just talking about how that's weird because we're, we're kind of in the same industry and you know a lot of uh, folks on my team. And, I know and folks... she used to come to the office a lot, way back when. Way back when. Uh, <laughs> perhaps an era we don't – I don't know if we want to get into. Nah, we don't, nah, listen, we don't talk about it. Yeah. Uh, but welcome, Kristen. So glad that you can join us um, and represent the entire um, uh, young buying – Car consuming public and speaking on their behalf. That's 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 why you're here. I'm glad you picked someone from New York City to represent that. Great. Yes. Yes. Well, also, you know, Ed and I realize that we are, you know, aging out of uh, of life. Not only not only of cars, but the, one of the things I want to talk about because you know we are talking about the future of the car, right? Right. Um, is you know there will be a time supposedly when cars won't even come with steering wheels. They won't have pedals. Uh, you know maybe there won't even be a driver's seat. It'll just be like you're in a train. And you know we review cars now. By the time cars don't have steering wheels, Ed and I will be in the old folks' home. Right. But you're younger than us, so uh, you know in theory you want to keep working until you retire uh, or get sent off to the old folks' home by your children. Um, what is the role? of a car reviewer when you no longer drive a car start off with an easy one then we kind of just review the experience um with all of the electrification that i feel like that's already kind of heading there you know because a lot of electric cars drive similarly to other electric cars like if you were to blindfold me and put me in a tycon versus um a model s and didn't tell me what it was and just accelerated the noise wouldn't be ind- indicative of what is running it. The ride is good. They're good at speed. They handle well. They break everything. So I think we're approaching this, mm. um, I guess, the space where driving an electric car is going to be more about the experience and the packaging more so than the driving experience itself. So I see my job heading out into this as we start having no more engines and then no more steering wheels. It's just going to be well, what does this interior and what does this package do for people that other stuff doesn't? It's like smartphones. Like all smartphones do basically the same thing. They all yep. look kind of the same. Yep. There's a reason why people choose certain ones over others. 
So wait, are you That's a good point? Are you excited about this this future? Are you interested in it, or are you on the sort of like, man, it's gonna suck when you know we don't drive ourselves or? Yeah. Um, well, I don't think the we don't drive ourselves. Like, I don't think we're going to be driven around by machines anytime soon. Sure. So that makes me relieved. It's something that I struggle with right now, writing car reviews. Everyone used to say, oh, you get to drive a crossover. It's so boring. There's plenty to talk about with a crossover. You can talk about the engine. You can talk about the transmission, its brakes. Um, you know, they all kind of follow the same rule. But I'm writing more and more EV reviews now, and it's challenging whenever I get down to the driving experience section of it. Because like I just said, all the driving experience is really similar. Instant torque, totally quiet. So we have to evaluate what? We evaluate on, I guess, NVH and how the interior is laid out because right. they are no longer beholden to an engine in the front or back or whatever. All the batteries are in the bottom. So how do right. they space out the cabin space? And is there a front trunk? Is there a rear trunk? Is the interior cool? Is the infotainment easy to use? That's what I'm seeing myself talk about more because there's just so little to talk about with driving experience. Right. Interesting. So well, we're, we're getting we're getting to the point where cars are becoming more like phones or computers or yeah. And I think you know the the this whole this whole thing where all the batteries are now it's a skateboard uh, you know platform. They're under the floor essentially. You're right. Like they all generally in broad strokes kind of handle the same you, I always talk about I find myself writing it's got that planted feeling it's because the <laughs> you know, the, the low center of gravity and it, and it turns really in an unexpected way for such a heavy vehicle and I think this is, you know my operating theory is that the big the big sort of coming changeover point for how we describe the sensation of an electric car is going to be um, when they figure out how to reduce the mass so when we get to lighter weight batteries um, that's going to have a huge because because otherwise it's like man these things are like crazy amounts of power and torque right and then it's instant on, but they all feel kind of heavy. So if we can get past that, and I think actually this is something I've been thinking about a lot. All that's going to come. It it doesn't necessarily require some crazy advancement in batteries. They would be nice in uh, battery technology, the chemistry, making the batteries either you know super uh, much. Higher uh, storage capacity or faster discharge, well, solid or, state, or so you don't have to have liquid. Yeah. Right, yeah. but I think actually, if that doesn't happen, and there's kind of fifty-fifty whether the technology, the battery technology, get there, we might be able to get there through connected car, right? Because once cars all start talking to each other, like really, like are in you know constant communication with each other, with the network, with infrastructure, with your home, with your, where you're going, et cetera. We can probably start pulling a lot of the other heavy stuff out of the car, right? Like, theoretically, if cars never crash, you know, if, they, if they're always talking to each other, never crash, you might not need airbags. You might not need super thick and, and chunky uh, A-pillars or crumple zones. You might be able to do something wild and actually do like a birdcage, like an old Maserati birdcage, like where the whole thing's like open and you're just sitting on the Just made out of sapphire. Made out of, <laughs> ma- made out of the hopes and dreams of, right. of our children or something, right? right? right. Like, well, hey, maybe. And it, then that would take a lot, of, a lot of mass. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty far away. But yeah. again, but the weight is a frontier. It's uh, um, Curious, what you said was interesting about the you know a long time from now because you know I agree that that'll be fascinating. But getting this timeline right, first of all, it's impossible, right? It's like predict the future accurately. Like who's going to win the Super Bowl? Uh, You know who knows. But you know Packers. Yeah, well, I hope it's the Packers. But you talked. I remember, gosh, about five years ago now, talking to a Porsche engineer. This is the only American engineer that worked on the 918, and he said within ten years Porsches won't have steering wheels. And then, like, a week later, I was talking to a guy from BMW. He's like, 50 years. That's when cars will drive themselves. It's so complicated. We wasted a billion dollars on it. Never going to happen. So what, what do you think is going to be the time frame for that when cars, no steering wheels, uh, maybe are fully connected and you can make them lighter and smaller, or shape them like whatever? That's so hard for me to say because those guys are, I think, more informed than I am because they actually are seeing right. – the sausage being made. I can only tell you what they tell us. Fifty years sounds good. <laughs> sounds optimistic. I'll be dead. I'll be long dead. So I think we all will be because mine will explode by then. So we don't have well, to think about it. There's <laughs> that's a cop out, but it's also a good cop out. Um, you know, it's like 
are we talking the first prototypes will come out or by the time everybody has no steering wheels and everybody's connected? Because that's going to take even longer. We're seeing the dawn of the new era now, which is where automakers are experimenting with more and more advanced data systems and electrification and changing the way a cabin looks. But I firmly believe until the last person has that, we haven't truly made progress. Because I do think that progress moves as fast as the slowest common denominator, right? So now we have all of these cars like the Teslas and the Taycans and the EQSs that have amazing uh, semi-autonomous features and they're really safe and they're electrified and they have amazing ranges. But as far as I'm concerned, as long as the, you know, the single parent who lives in an apartment complex and needs that beater car to get from A to B, as long as those cars are out of reach of that person, I don't think we've really solved the problem because that's a lot of people. That's a lot of the people. So we can't just keep selling these fancy electronic toys to people who can afford them. We need to get them to people who like actually need them who might not be able to afford them right now. Right. And super fair because that's exactly kind of what this whole thing we're doing, the inevitable, is about. It's, you know, we feel like mass adoption of electrified, not necessarily electric vehicles, is inevitable. It's coming. We are... I think through the phase of the early adopters, all the folks that bought a Tesla Model S uh, back when it came out in 2013, and are the sort of the the tip of the spear, if you will, in terms of converting to electrification. But you're 100% accurate. Like, until there is that, not even the $35,000 EV, until once there's the $20,000 EV and it gets over, I'd say, 250 miles of range, you know, and if you live in an apartment, you can ch- you can charge it. Like, there's, a, there's some way to do it. Right. Yeah. Then yeah, yeah. It, there's a lot of barriers. And then you're talking like beyond that. I mean, there, there's, this, there's this huge gap. Everyone thinks it's or we talk about it like that's going to be EVs. And then like the next day, it'll be autonomous vehicles. Like, no, you're going to have to have a whole other transitional stage in there as you know, ADAS and self-driving technology ramps up and then talks to architecture, talks to, you know, I mean, sorry, talks to infrastructure before you can go to this fully autonomous route. So, But that's a really great point because I think it is pretty easy to like, you know, look out your front door in Sunnyvale and everyone's yeah, LA in, or everyone's in a 1,200 square foot, $2.8 million house right. with, with Teslas and say like, yeah, this future is coming, but like, oh, totally. You know, if you're in rural America. Oh, over the holidays, I went to I went to visit my in-laws in Colorado, and uh, and I'm planning all this stuff for the future of mobility, future of the kind. I'm looking around like, mm, there's <laughs> a lot of trucks around here, and there's I saw like one uh, EV charger, like buried behind like a warehouse, and it was like uh, one of those what is that Chadmo like the level the ones that they yeah. for first gen Leafs, and yeah, it looked yeah. like nobody had used it in like five years. Right, right. So right. it's like hmm, this is it's going to take a while to reach every part of this. And country. we live in a country where we don't bootstrap people up. Like you know right. what I mean? If we were in say Norway, they could you know that they, they everyone has a basic guaranteed income, and and you right. can you can do this kind of thing here. Like you know how many homeless people did I pass? Sure. Uh, driving to Beverly Hills this morning. Freedom yeah. of choice. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, look. That's, that's the thing. It's not even rural America. I have um, a, a colleague who is doing this very test right now in Columbus, Ohio. You know, big metropolitan area, lots of people, lots of roads. He's having problems finding chargers for all the EVs sure. that he's has been testing. And that's like not that far from New York City. And he's having trouble. And the other point that you just made about trying to find a charger um this is a story i wrote for business insider it was like i don't know if it was just me or or feeling vulnerable whatever but so many public chargers are located in like sketchy places that are out of the way and are not places that i as a small woman like to be at at night alone and like you know come out like fumble with your wallet to put the card in and everything like it was making me feel unsafe when i was charging the car and i know that you know that's that's, a fascinating point charging yeah outside they most of the time you know you you have the charger at home and you have one at your workplace but for all those people in between that are you know just pull off the highway because they need a charger they don't not staying somewhere with a charger you have to go find one right it's usually like the back of an office park or whatever and it's super shady to go oh, there yeah. and this is a that's a great point and i actually had a, a very similar conversation with uh hyundai cmo angela zapeta she mentioned as we were talking about the transition from uh, ice to ev from gas to electric She's like, it shouldn't be discounted, the, the, the large percentage of women who actually find um, 
They're, they associate a gas station with safety and security. And I was like, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't want to go to a gas station ever. If I don't have to, like, why would I want? She's like, no, no, no. When, you're, when your gas is low in your car and you're driving someplace you've never been or you're on a highway of somewhere, it's, it's bright. It's well lit. You, there's somebody in there. You can fill up. And then you can also fill up the gas tank in less than 10 minutes probably and then be on your way, right? It's, very, as you mentioned, a very different story if you're going to some random charger from a charging network and it's in the middle of nowhere. And they probably put it on the cheapest land they could find because real estate's a thing. Um, I was actually talking about this with – oh, it was with, I think we were talking about it with Spike when he, about his, um, his pleasure in charging his Tesla. Right. And how Tesla actually has has – I don't know if intentionally done this, but their supercharger networks are because there's so many, and they they tend to be, especially in California, like along well trafficked corridors next to restaurants. I I wonder whether actually, do you feel the same way about? Is that represent a safe spot? Is that like a like a Tesla supercharging station that is going to be well trafficked because there's just so many Teslas? Is that present the same sort of comfort, or are you also like eh, it's a little skeevy because? I like the idea of a filling station for exactly the reasons that you laid out. It's brightly lit. There's a store, there's a bathroom, and there's always an attendant there. Mm. Um, even if it's next to something that's well-traveled, even if it's next to a business, I pull in the gas stations 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, I don't expect a restaurant to be open then. I don't expect Kohl's mm, or Walmart right. or Target to be open then. But the gas station is always open, and there's always someone in there because it's 24 hours. Um So the Tesla supercharger network is around here in New York City. It's not as prevalent in California, obviously. But I I still like the attendant. um, Got it. Electrify America, Tesla, supercharger. It's all kind of the same to me. Okay, right. right. I'd like an an unmanned. But what a great point because that's something. Look, I'm a 230, 40-pound guy and, you know, no one's – Never crossed your mind. Never, not in a million. No one's ever bothered me. You know what I mean? Like I just never – I've never felt unsafe. Um, even I used to live in like the sketchiest parts of LA, like never even thought about it, you know? So that's, you know, it's funny, like, that's a fascinating when I was writing point. That story, I was researching it. I was like, Oh, uh, safety while charging electric vehicle. And the first stories that came up were like, Oh yeah, it's safe to charge the electric vehicle in the rain. Don't worry about it. I was like, mm, right, right, right. Okay, so we're concerned about the safety of the vehicle. What about the safety of the person charging it? Right. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, this this leads me and I'll talk about you know. Let's open this up. The inevitable. So you know what we do has been a very white male dominated industry for a long, long time. Um, you know, you were an anomaly for a long time. Mm. Uh, not a lot of Jewish guys. There's been a couple, but not a lot. Right. But. Um, you know, Kristen, you as uh, you know, a woman of color and a woman, uh, like, how did you do this? You've achieved, like, you know, you're you're not, I don't know about a household, but at least people are in the cars, you're a household name. How d- how did you get to where you are? I'm fascinated by that. Um, I just didn't take no for an answer, <laughs> basically. Uh, I when I first started doing this, I think I was 19 or 20 by the time I decided I wanted to be a car writer. Um, And maybe it's my privilege that I never thought that being a woman of color would be a detriment. In fact, I thought it would be a a plus because I was like, well, I look at all these stories in Top Gear and and Road and Track and Motor Trend. They're all written by white dudes. seems to me like they need someone different like me. So I just had that kind of (laughs) attitude. I just went about it in the best way that I could. Um, I started out school in Boston, um, but there's, like, no cars in Boston because right. it's too cold all the time. And the, um, the so worst like, drivers in America by 100. Yeah. Times, yeah. There's, like, car culture Sorry. there. It wasn't really what I was looking for, and there were also no um, outlets there that I knew of. All the outlets I knew were in Southern California. So I transferred schools to USC, and that's how Johnny and I got to know each other. Yeah, that's right. Fight on. Um, that's how Johnny and I got to know each other. Uh, and... Um, you know, we, uh, like, I started a vlog, and just because it's, I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to write, I'm going to do this in earnest, and I want to have a body of writing to show people. Made a few YouTube videos, and uh, made some friends in the industry. Uh, basically, it was, it literally came down to cold emailing them, being like, hey, I saw that you're in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Are you guys accepting interns this summer? It was Mike Carley and um, Jonathan Ramsey at Autoblog at the time, and the both of them were like, who's this girl? <laughs> But, you know, they looked at my stuff and they're like, she seems all right. So I tagged along with them a couple of times and then uh, they kicked me a couple of passes to the L.A. Auto Show. So I went there and I networked my ass off, um, made a few friends there. And then once I graduated college, I just kind of kept writing and I kept my head down and like 
got a job in automotive PR because um, no one was hiring writers at the time, or no one was hiring me because I was relative nobody. But I got the job to kind of stay relevant and keep my eyes open. And then um, the job at Road and Track opened up. So I did my cold email thing again. And I was like, hey, so I applied for this job and I didn't hear back. I, can I ask you a few questions about it? And um, that editor was like, oh, you know, um, thanks for emailing. I guess he liked the initiative. So set me up with an interview. Um, and I guess they liked what they saw there and uh, gave me the job. So I was there for six months and then I got laid off. And then I got the Jalopnik job for four years. And then I left that for Business Insider and I left that after a year and now I'm here, um, which is a really roundabout way of saying that, yeah, I just didn't take no for an answer. Hmm. Did you have any, again, cause you know, just like what you just said about, about charging safety where I literally the last thing I ever, if you would have said, sure. what's the problem with EVs? The last thing I would have thought of. Did you have you had any like um, obstacles related to being a female that that I wouldn't know about? Because again, I've 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 had you know I mean I've had a lot of obstacles to get where I am, but you know I, I mainly look like, your own. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, like any anything for anyone watching out there, like what 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 do they what do they watch out for? Um, yeah, I think I joined during a very fortunate time. By the time I joined up, I think a lot of outlets knew that they had a diversity issue hmm. um, and they were actively trying to fix that. Um, and I, I, it's this is the part that's kind of difficult for me because I always because I have uh, imposter syndrome really bad even now. I'm like, oh, so do I. So do I. Don't. People, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you wonder, like, did those people respond to my emails? Did they give me the interview because they saw a woman of color, because they saw someone of value here. And the thing that I always need to tell myself is even if they saw that as a diversity opportunity, the fact that you got yourself through the door and that you're still here means that you're doing a good job and you are valued. Um, yeah. Oh, so that's yeah. what I keep telling myself. But in terms of actually dealing with industry uncoolness, not really. Everyone that I've worked with has been super cool and supportive. It's when you go on trips and I guess you deal with journalists who are older. Um, sometimes they'll say things like his age, you, but it's oh. never too no older, way older. <laughs> I, like, a couple times, a couple times there's been I like I've been on drives where someone will come up to me and be like, "Oh, that guy over there, like he was talking," and I'm like, "Which guy? Point him out." And they're like. Oh, like they left already. I'm like, so you came over here to tell me that someone has a problem with me, but you won't tell me who it is or hmm. anything like oh, that. Oh, that's weird. Um, that's is it like was, is it like clumsy, weird. dumb stuff? Like, uh, do you know how to drive manual? Or like, is it like that's happened? That's happened a couple times. Okay. Um, but like, not a whole lot. One time, the car was being dropped off at the office, and so I went down to claim it, and the guy looked up, was like, "Oh, this is this is a manual." I was like, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> and he's like, can you drive a manual? I was like, the car is for Jalopnik, is it not? I'm picking it up for Jalopnik. He was like, okay. I was like, Well, okay. look, I, I remember being at Jalopnik when half the staff couldn't drive manual. <laughs> There's only four of us, but <laughs> Zing. that was a long, long Long well, okay. Yeah. Th this is uh, okay. That's a good setup for what I'm going to ask next, and then I'm going to apologize ahead of time because I feel like, um, have you ever been asked? Uh, and I was kind of I kind of made jokes in the and when I reached out and and, and sort of gave you some uh, s talking points ahead of time. Like, have you ever been asked like to speak on behalf of your generation or your gender? And you're just like, oh god, this is so dumb. Because I'm going to ask you um, to do that next. <laughs> I have. I Ed have. only sees gender and race. Probably. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> He doesn't see color. No. no. Right. Or um, age. Age. I only have. Sees there's, the, you know, there's ways of asking that. And the way I think you asked is fine. I mean, also my imposter syndrome is like, what do I know? I don't know. But okay. I'll do my best. But there have been times when someone has approached me and was like, hey, uh, we want you to talk about our new lifestyle vehicle. And we thought you would be the best person for that. I was like, okay, chill. Why? And they're like, oh, well, because you're uh, – you're young and Asian and female and otherwise, you know, we would we, we usually go after the Matt Farrows of the world, but we felt that this vehicle would be, you know, better with mm. you. And I was like, what? Right. And then he, he like didn't understand why that was, was offensive. Bad. Sure. So I declined politely. Ah, oh, you should have taken it and just hammered it and like just been the most like <laughs> Matt Farah esque review of it. Or, I don't know. I, 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 there, were, there were like a whole other like, reason of reasons why no, that was a bad sense. There was, there was a whole world of reasons why that wouldn't have been appropriate, which I can tell you guys offline. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was an off the record conversation. Okay. But I walked away from that being like, 
That's so weird. I thought you would talk about uh, like an article that I wrote or something that you thought was good or had some good insight or something like that. It was none of that. It was literally just all of my politics. That was the reason. Oh, boy. Well, um, again, well, just so you know, real quick, you're here because uh, of how well you did on Shift Talkers. <laughs> right. We were looking we were talking about podcast guests and your name came up like she was. Yeah, great. You're here because Johnny like really said like, man, she crushed it on. So Shift Talkers, for those of you who don't know, was a Motor Trend show, a series that we did. It's basically a talk show, a chat show. Uh, hosted by Jeff Jablonski. No, by Glucker. Uh, yeah. Jeff, sorry, Glucker. Yeah. And uh, uh, you've been on it, what, three times? Three or four. Yeah, oh. something like that. I think three or four. And crushed it. Um, so Johnny was like, let's get on. I'm like, let's do it. And then, and you actually dovetail into what I'm going to ask you next, which is a part of, again, this inevitable content series we're doing, talking about the future of the car, future of mobility, where it's all going, the transition from gas cars to electric cars. You know, we did some research. Actually, it wasn't specifically for this. Uh, we have a car shopping side of Motor Trend, and we, on a regular basis, try to figure out what the consumer wants. And we we hired a independent third-party business analyst, and they did a big survey on car shopping. And one of the, the takeaways was specifically to EV shopping was – some really fascinating stuff, which I pulled out of this this enormous uh, deck that they provided, and that one, only old people, and old is a relative term, but only people 55 or older have EV skepticism, okay? Uh, according to this research study we did, 85% of 18 to 34-year-olds and 82% of 35 to 54-year-olds say they are, ex they are expecting to buy or consider purchasing an EV in the next 15 years. And the 15 years part really stands out to me because that's kind of this time frame we're talking about as the, the, a transitional period for the mass adoption of electric vehicles. Um, so 85% of 18 to 34-year-olds, 82% of 35 to 54-year-olds say they will definitely or probably consider an EV. Is that accurate? Can you speak on behalf of all 18 to 54-year-olds uh, and give us a read on uh, – or, or I, honestly, personally, are you considering an EV purchase? Is this, is this inevitable for you or your friends or your core group or, or whatever? Like, what do you got? Well, what I need to do is I need to get out of – Manhattan or New York City I need right. to get out and actually get myself a garage because there's nowhere for me to put my car anywhere here, EV, right. uh, EV or not. But so my my ideal setup once I scrounge the cash together and get out of here and get a house and a garage is, yeah, we would consider an EV, but maybe not so much the the new OEM ones that are coming out right now. I think Johnny knows the answer to this question. Like I would get a classic mini EV swap. That's what we think about now when my partner and I talk about our EV uh, adoption, you know, the, the current EV now, current EVs now are, are fine and, and a lot of fun, but they're all kind of expensive. We want something little and darty, which is the lightness factor that you were okay. talking about, Ed. That's, uh, that's fun to me and that is attractive to me. And one of the reasons that I want to do that is, yeah, I have a lot of climate guilt and it's, it's, I feel like that's probably something the millennial generation has just inherited um, there's climate guilt everywhere I see, and I can't really justify buying, you know, something brand new off the line with a big V8 anymore, especially with gas prices going the way they are. And every new UN climate report that comes out is just horrible. And there's plastic everywhere. I can't really square with that anymore. So I suspect that a lot of millennials are in the same place as me. I know my mom is in the same place as me. She's definitely not a millennial. She, she also says, um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how old she is, but she's in the old people care category. She says her next car is going to be an electric car because she also has a lot of climate guilt. Oh, well, this is awesome because you just also you, – you simultaneously answered the second question or validated, which is – again, according to this research we did, most EV – most recent EV shoppers cite environmental reasons for buying EV before anything practical – it's not necessarily about uh, saving money on gas or that they like the way it drove or that it's theoretically less maintenance. 58% of recent purchasers said it's um, it's environmental concerns. I like the term climate guilt. I've never heard that. That's a great term. Where, think, where, yeah. where, where's that term from? That's a fantastic Twitter. term. It's from Twitter. <laughs> okay. I, I, I wrote it down and underlined it because I love that. That's a wonderful term. So what, and so what is driving – 
what is driving climate guilt? Is it Greta Thunberg? Is it is it every report that you see all the uh, all the is it the Amazon forest burning down that that kind of stuff and that, and that like you've been assaulted by that throughout yeah, your yeah I just I think I think I'm way too online for my own good. Mm. It would probably be better if I was less online, but yeah, it's it's the culmination of seeing the Amazon forest being on fire all the time and <laughs> seeing wildfires for you guys and horrendous rainstorms up here in the northeast we had a tornado here a few months ago like it literally touched down in new jersey and people were taking pictures of it that's not supposed to happen oh this, here. this last week and it was snowing in hawaii or something like that oh like, no not only yeah. was it, not was it like snowing crazy. in hawaii it was the only uh, of the uh of 50, of 50 states there was snowing in two states hawaii and alaska it wasn't <laughs> snowing in the other 48 states yeah. in december that's yeah, it was crazy that's wild. And then, and then they'll do things like, oh, it was the hottest summer on record in the in Antarctica here. And my my second big passion, this is nerd. My second big passion is animals. So I watch a lot yeah. of like nature and animal documentaries. And every single one is like, so here's beautiful coral reefs. And then they'll do like a like a time lapse of what it used to look like versus what it looks like now. And they're like, this is what the heating up in the acidic oceans have done to the coral reefs. And then you know, the icebergs are melting, so the polar bears and the walruses don't have a place to live anymore. I'm like, what do you want me to do with that? I'll stop driving V8s if you want. Sure. But okay. what, what am I supposed to do? So it's just this crushing, like, existential climate guilt. And I know this got really dark, but no, no, no. that's the burden that I walk around with okay. day to day. No, all right. Well, that, look, I, I that's, again, you're... Um... You are validating uh, a lot of, uh, again, this research that we did, which is great. Um, let's take a little break here because Johnny's got a Yeah, sorry, I got a technical issue. My headphone just blew out for some reason. So, so far, we're two for two here. So, yes, you're sort of considering it, but there are practical con- concerns because you live in a city. You want something small, a mini EV. Climate guilt is driving it. Um, this other one, this third piece, and we'll, we can stop on this one because it's, uh, it's pretty good. You know, we come from this again. We're like, I want to say, at least ten years, maybe fifteen years older. When we're, in our in our professional careers, because we again, Motor Trend gave out Car of the Year to the Tesla Model S in the fall of 2012 as our 2013 Car of the Year. The entire time of the development of that vehicle and the, for the years after, its range anxiety was a big thing. Oh, range! Can it go that far? Oh, 250, 265, 268, 300. Like, what is the ideal range? No longer, apparently, is uh, range anxiety the biggest uh, issue. It actually comes down to cost. So cost of the EV is a primary concern. Uh, 45% and 47% of those two age groups, the 18 to 34-year-olds and the 34 to 54-year-olds, 50, cited costs as being the major concern. Uh, ahead of charging practicality was the second one. So range anxiety is third at best in terms of folks considering um, an EV. Does that – how does that track with you? Is that sort of um, – uh, I know you mentioned uh, – you know, buying used or buying something like sort of just small and and uh, uh, like a mini a mini EV in general. But what what do you think? I would rank cost up there with range anxiety. Hmm. Um, I think range anxiety is reactionary to our currently horrible charging infrastructure. Right. The gas companies and the gasoline industry has over a hundred years on what we currently have. So obviously that's going to take time, but I don't own an EV, but I know that the driving that I do do, there's like two places that I drive to. I drive to see my parents in New Jersey and I drive to see my partner's parents in Vermont. The New Jersey drive is easy because that's, I don't know, like 50 miles round trip. Any EV could do that. But his parents live 300 miles away, one one way. And in Vermont. Vermont's the hardest place to get to in America. There's no freeways that go to Vermont. So. It's, it's nuts. There, yeah. You can take, okay, so you can take 87 into it, um, and then, you know, it splits off and it becomes like a few things. But, yeah, you're right. They're, they're pretty small roads there. Yeah. Um, and for a trip like that, which we make pretty regularly, that's where the range anxiety would get me. Um, and if I knew that there was going to be a charger somewhere up there at the place that I always stop at. Yeah, that would be one thing, but I don't know if it's going to be there. I haven't done it yet. Okay. I was going to say there, there have, there, there, there must be, I mean, Vermont's also a a very green state. Not parts of it. Not parts. Yeah, sure. I mean the, (laughs) the Bernie Sanders part. Yeah, but it's close to New Hampshire. It ain't that green. I mean, and I mean, green, green, obviously in the spring and the summer, but also like green (laughs) from a, from a a political perspective. So are there, We'll probably get annihilated for this, but anyway, I'm assuming there are 
uh, uh, Charge Point and Electri America yeah. stations yeah, I, somewhere. I, I actually want to do this trip um, in 2022. I just want to see what it's like. Uh, it's, it's I, t- I recommend doing it. I just did a thing with my son where we had we had an Audi with the RS e-tron GT, and we had to go to Morro Bay, and there was a, a, a fire. Uh, caused by climate change in Santa Barbara, so we had to go the other way. Mm. And it was this comedy of, like, human error, machine error, and infrastructure error. And, you know, on paper, it's 120 miles from my house, but in reality, it was was an adventure, you know? And, like, you know, showing up at... uh, 9 p.m. at night to where the, the, the Audi NAS system says there's a charger with 11% range and a really grumpy four-year-old and the cable's been cut off. <laughs> you know, it's an adventure. So you got to think of it that way. It's, it's a lot of fun. I recommend, highly yeah, recommend so you I, do it. I think when I do it, we're going to do it because usually what we do is we'll speed run it on Thursday night um, and just ball up there at 8 p.m. and get, get in at 2 or whatever. But I think we might spend a whole day doing it just to meander up there and see what the charging situation is like, mm. um, which is really roundabout way of saying I have range anxiety, but I'm not the typical EV buyer. Most people right. drive. I think the statistic is like their commute is an average of 18 miles. Right. I could be totally making this up, but it's no. well within the, the – I the, mean, those are the stats from the Chevy Volt, Volt being Volt. 38 Volt. They were, they were was, saying, yeah. yeah it, was, it was 38 miles was the, was the range, and the average commute was 18 or right. something like that. And, they, yeah. and that's why they okay. had 40 or something. Yeah, yeah. But always um, I recommend – What's that again? Of, oh. I'm always suspicious of OEM statistics. Oh, sure. Statistics like you, you don't think 100% of Range Rover owners are off-roading every day? Really? Come on. <laughs> um, but I recommend get a car with small range. Make an adventure out of it. Don't don't cop out and get a Lucid and just, yeah, just, just do it in MX-30. one shot. Yes. Get the MX-30 with 100 miles. <laughs> do it that way. Actually, speaking of that, what yes. about that? I, I know you just drove the uh, Hyundai Ionic 5. Which is a car I can't stop looking at because it's like the best looking Giajaro '80s design I've seen in well since the '80s. Blade Runner. What we haven't driven it. What you have? What 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 is that like? And could you do that Vermont trip in that car? Yeah, I could. It's super comfortable. It's really quiet. It's really comfortable. Or I said that already. It's um, it's quiet and it's really good at long range. What I like the most about it when I was talking about cabins that have been optimized for people. That car has totally been optimized for people inside, the front row at least. The front row, it's got um, no transmission tunnel, obviously, so it's just a flat floor between the two seats, so you can kind of just slide over. It should be a bench seat. I think there should be an option yes. bench seat. I'm, I'm a huge water. bench seat fan. I wanted. I told Ralph Gio to put a bench seat in a Viper. <laughs> uh, actually, in a speech why, on stage, why, drunk. How, but why did he looked at me that? like, oh, yeah. what you, I mean, what are you yeah. talking? Well, about? Ralph looks like at you like, uh, like yeah. that a lot. Yeah. But uh, I, I love it. I, that, um, well, that's part of what I was talking about when you know when you know steering wheels go away, that interior will change. And it, I will say, it's cool to see Hyundai doing that because one of the things I didn't like about the Santa Cruz compared to the Maverick was the Maverick they designed a truck interior. Yes, and the Santa Cruz was it was one of the Sportage or I don't even know what it Tucson was interior. Tucson Tucson. And that's all it was. Right. It, it, they, they did just, all the sheet metal stuff. You're like, wow, this thing looks great. And you're like, oh, it's inside like the same. nothing. So, so you're saying this is a totally clean sheet, like doesn't yeah. look doesn't look and feel like uh, any other Hyundai in the lineup. Okay, that's cool. No, yeah. it feels really clean sheet, and that cool pixel looking motif also extends inside the cabin. Awesome. So you'll see it on the door cards and on the seat. They dro- they gave us the highest trim of ones. Of course, so I don't know if that's Good. the case with the low yeah. trim ones. Right, that's put forward. <laughs> Who wants to see uh, the low trims? Right. But besides that, the way it drives is so accurate to what we were talking about. It It's really big, and it gets smaller when you get moving, and all the weight is at the bottom, and it accelerates really fast, and it holds right. corner really well because all the weight is under you, so on and so forth. That part of it, you know, it's it's what we, we are. Should ha- we should have an AI, uh, AI-powered AI car review that covers, like, it's like, you know, when the, when an earthquake happens, you know that most earthquake reports, especially the ones that hit Twitter, are done by a robot. Yeah, because it, well, all it says is like this is the it tells you what magnitude on the Richter scale, where it was centered, 
And then if there's anything like weird that happened in the shutdown. So we could do that for this sort of coming wave of EVs where like we describe in sort of general terms the, 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 because they all kind of drive and ride the same. I'm going to get if, if you get annihilated like, by that. If, if, no, but if you, if you get a stock report about like what's happening in the market, it, right. it's computer writes it. Right. Yeah. It just so tells it you covers this, that is up, this part. Is down. Yeah. And then the human comes in and just tells you what's different. From, right. Like what's unique. Now, I will say, though, I, I, yesterday I, I got to drive. I drove the Lucid Air Dream Edition P. So it's the 1,111 horsepower power version and the um, Lucid Air Grand Touring. But they've this particular one I drove, they're updating the suspension and they made a couple uh, hardware changes, a lot of software changes. But the best part the guy told me was uh, Dave, who's a you know their vehicle dynamics engineer, he touroed a Porsche GT3, a 991.2, and he'd drive the Porsche for 20 minutes, drive the Lucid for 20 minutes, reprogram the Lucid, get back in the Porsche, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And he did. He spent forty eight hours doing this, and um, it did drive a lot better than the other one. Like it really, it, it you know. And he was he was explain, he was talking in words I don't understand. He's like, yeah, well, you know, it's one point four hertz uh, damper reaction in the front, then you want one point two in the rear because if it's equal, then it feels like it's jumping. You don't want that. You want to smooth out the way and blah, blah, blah. slightly out of phase. Or oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was it was cool to see that like. To go against what you're talking about, that you can make EVs actually handle better. You just got to sure. take the time and do it. Right. You know. Yeah. Right, but for this use case, it. yeah, the so Ionic Five, it's it's not a it's not going to be a hundred and sixty seventy thousand dollars. What's what's the price point on that? TBA. They okay. said that they would get me the information uh, a few days after the drive. Well, what's so. how much how much power does it make? The one I drove makes 300 in the little change, I think. But it's it's one or the other. So you can have the 300 horsepower one, or you can have the 300 mile one, but not both. Right, and then and then what's the so 300 mile is the big range. It's the top of the three, range. 320 or something like that. 350. Yeah, 320. I think is yeah. the horsepower on the all wheel, the dual motor one, and then the rear wheel drive one is not that. It's but you do get 300 miles of range. <sighs> How do you choose? <laughs> you you got you to pay 170 grand for a lucid, <laughs> right? Oh, come on, very very easy. You all, you know for for all the Californians who you know you know panic when a, a bit of moisture hits the ground. You got to get the all wheel drive, one. right? You got to get the all wheel drive. So, I know. You know well, I, I want the horsepower at the end of the day, but you know maybe the range is good. Well, um, did you like? Did you like it overall? I mean, it's on my consider just based on how it looks. It's on my consideration list of uh, yeah. Baby I really models. liked it. It's huge. Um, really? It, yeah. During the presentation, they're like, "This uh, wheelbase is longer than the Palisade. It's the biggest uh, <laughs> part of the thing." Like, the Palisade. Well, that's wow. what's so cool about it because it looks Small. like mini. It, it looks, looks like, like a, a Mark One oh, Golf in it's pictures. Such- it's such funhouse stuff. When you look at it in pictures, you're like, that looks like a little hatchback, like an integrale, right? Yeah. And then you actually walk up to it. It's giant. And then you walk around it. You're like, this feels like someone on Twitter observed. They're like, this feels like a hatchback, but like 130% yeah. stretched. And then you drive it and it feels small once again. So it's kind of this big, little, big, little undulation situation that your brain goes through when you approach this thing. Oh, man. So, good for Hyundai. So, did, you know? so like, second row is so good, like t- super roomy then? Yeah. And then is yeah, it – but I mean, there's no like, third it's row? Not, it's not super roomy. It's okay. roomy. Um, also flat floor. And because the test car that I had had the big panoramic right. um, glass, right. the – cabin the greenhouse was really good visibility was good trunk was big it's a big car and it fits a lot of stuff so but, i would definitely consider taking that one up to is, is there a frunk um <laughs> yes so, but it's like a little box that sits on top of whatever else they have under there see this is where so yeah, I, okay so yeah, i was yeah. about to write a rant about it and then i was like where's the frunk and they're like oh no, no we have one i was like where is it there's just an engine cover when i opened it up they're like it's underneath the engine cover and it's 0.85 liters of front space. So is my coffee cup. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's... so we like we went out there to look at it and they're like, yeah, you know, you can fit um a laptop in there. I was like, who's putting laptop in the front? If it's right. like a bottle of wine, you can put wine in there. Um cables, like toe straps, <laughs> stuff like that. So it's pretty but useless. Oh, could you well uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Could you put the charging could you put the charging cable, the whole kit in there, the the handle I the thing? didn't Probably not. have time to pull out the charging cable, but 
the Mm -hmm. Hyundai guys with me who were vested in the product said that you could put cables in there. But But that means you'd have to actually take the time to fold it properly, which no one can do, you know. No, everyone just like... Yeah, just smash it up, throw it in the back. So, uh, uh, hang on. You said the wheelbase is about... uh, Bigger than a Palisade. palisade, But there's no way you could do a third row on this, right? No, I don't think so, because the trunk height is... Is higher right, up. Okay. So Stadium seating. Not space for people. It's I got. I got. I got to check this thing out. Um, anything else fun you want to talk about coming up? Or you want to plug anything? Um, let me think. I'm just going to take this time to actually think, and maybe we can yeah. cut it because I'm. Not no, like, think. I, I, you know, thinking under pressure. Thinking under pressure can create, you know, it either goes really good or really bad, never never in between. So Right, and it's not the end of the year because this is in the future, so we can cut that part out. We can talk about I know, we should cut that part out. I'm you're like, super I'm excited like... about, man, it's, you know, it's the new year. And Leave like, it all in. Leave it all in. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Uh, See how looking forward to the made. New York Auto Show, question mark? Is there going to be no. a New York Auto Show? No. I, probably. It's already, they have dates announced. Right. It's April. But they canceled Geneva. Really? Yeah, Geneva. Okay. Yeah, Geneva's canceled. Like permanently? No, I mean this year for sure. Yeah. Maybe permanently. I don't know. I mean after. I thought they were doing the um, the UAE thing with Geneva, right? Uh, oh, they could be. They could be. It's the same. Yeah. Everything. UAE the Millie's and... moving to the UAE. So. Yeah, UAE, Geneva, same thing. Okay, that's the last. That's our last question. Let's do that. Let's do that. The future of the auto show. So, <laughs> I grew up going to the LA Auto Show every year with my dad. I look forward to it more than anything else. Um, that said, having covered five auto shows a year for 16 years, whatever it's been, like, I don't, I don't ever want to go to an auto show again. And they keep canceling it. And I'm like, great. But do they have a place? What is the future? Um, you know, as a journalist covering them, there's kind of no point because everything gets released like six hours beforehand anyways. Um, anyways, what, what are well, your yeah, thoughts? And, well, let's start there. Oh. Do you, do you have... Do you have fond memories, or do you, did you go to Javits every year and like, wow, this yeah. is yeah, and you, and you yeah, I did it. that. It was the, I remember the first time I went, it was so great. There were so many cars there; it was so exciting. And they had a demonstration of the then new ISF out in a, in an okay. alley somewhere where they put it on a dyno and they just ran it all the way up to Redline. Wait, can, 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 can I, how, how old were you? How old were you? Sixteen. Oh my god! I went, I went on a launch of that. <laughs> <laughs> this was 2008. So I, well, oh, I'm, I'm well aware. I'm well aware of, okay. how, of how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> but now, yeah. professionally, you've covered the New York Auto Show. I so I am, I guess, an anomaly. I like going to auto shows. Okay. I like for me, it's it's seeing all of my industry friends, seeing my industry contacts. I love um, that part. I love that part. Yeah. I I just mean it's it's getting less and less. Where like you're gonna see something you haven't seen before because it's all oh, online. No. What's nice is you get to see things um, without someone bothering you and there's no expectation of stopping and doing an interview or a conversation or something. Because if you, especially if you go on day two, this is getting real inside baseball. But if you go on day two, most of the PR people have left. Right. No one comes over to bother you. You just go in and you sit in the cars. You can count all the cup holders in the ascent or something. Right. And you, you can do silly stuff like that and check out a, like a paint color in person or sit in something and so on and so forth. Like, I really like doing that, but this year's LA auto show was not like that. Everything was locked first of all, because right. I think they wanted to keep people from congregating in yes. cars. Yes. Oh, so social like, distancing. Like, yeah. Pandemic. Yeah. Related. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, wait, I have a question. Ooh. And this is a, um, a, a sort of, uh, appearance race specific question. Have you ever been, um, mistaken or accused of maybe being from a Chinese manufacturer uh, involved in intellectual property theft? Um, no. Wait, has that happened to you? That's yes, so specific. Yes, 100%. Like <laughs> uh, Frankfurt, usually in one of the European shows, so Frankfurt, Geneva, or Paris, uh, especially pre-iPhone like iPhone or before we had photographers going, like I would carry around like a little camera. And like I'll be taking pictures of the car, I'll be taking pictures of the interior, and then somebody would be like, "You would, you, you must leave." And I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" And like, "What's going on?" And then they, the minute I speak like you know, accentless or uh, American accented English, they're like, "Oh, wait a second. And then I show them my badge. They're like, "Oh, sorry. We we thought you were one of the guys who's like taking pictures of our under the, the undercarriage or measuring something." I've I uh, not to defend the Germans, but I I, I remember in Paris one year I was standing next to this guy. I believe he was a Chinese guy, and he pulled a ruler, a metal ruler, sure. out of his sleeve and began measuring parts of the car. Yeah. And I was like, "What the? Like, I just never seen it before." I was like, "This is crazy." They got to get the rapid prototype done. Yeah, Come on, man. yeah. 
So, all right. Well, it's fun. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. I I always tell people it's. Uh, I, especially because in my career path, I had to follow um, Angus McKenzie, who was very distinctive looking and has this long hair, tall Australian. He looks like sort of Jesus of Nazareth uh, at an auto show. And meanwhile, <laughs> you know, the guy behind him is like this. It looks like a Toyota engineer. I'm like, hey, guys, thanks. That's great. Yeah, no, that's never happened to me. I think especially after I shaved the side of my head, like I don't look like someone who <laughs> would do punk. that. I think I look like American enough that they don't they don't bother me. But no, that's that's never happened. That's super messed up, though. I mean, again, I, 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 I'd always heard that happen, and I literally saw a guy, a metal ruler, come, and he was wearing, like, he, he was dressed, I mean, he looked like he was, like, out of North Korea. He was wearing, like, you know, like a white polo, a members-only jacket, like, you know, slacks tucked in, and then this ruler came out. He's just measuring stuff, and yeah. then, like, you know, inputting on some little mini laptop. That's what, you know, it is, uh, it looks, it's crazy. In, in defense of these, of the other manufacturers, it is pretty, sometimes, it is quite shameless. You'll see guys on their stomachs, like, l- under the cars, sh- putting their camera, their iPhone, taking sure. pictures of mounting points or God knows what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, that's hilarious. Um, well, we got the high sign. Go ahead. Sorry, to answer your, the other part yep. of your question, I don't think auto shows are dead. Maybe maybe for us media, but they're not always for us media. I think they're for totally. regular people to check out cars without being hounded by a salesman. Because that's another one of the bullet points that you sent over was people don't like dealerships because of that reason. They, right. they can't hate. check out a car. And they piece. hate. Right. Well, yeah, people I'll- over and, and hound them. It's not cool. That's a, but you know, but just back to Angus. That was one of Angus's big points of emphasis for Motor Trend employees. Was like, go to the auto show, not on press days. Go when the people go and and check out what the people are looking at. Right. Which is you know something you know we get in our little weird automotive ivory tower and brown like, manual wagon. Yeah, exactly. Well, just think you know AMGs, 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 whatever. And it's like, no, everyone's actually looking at, uh, well, not a minivan, but an SUV. They're looking at SUV. Or the Ford F-150 or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, the most yeah. popular vehicle. Like, no, and, and I will say, because I did go to the LA Auto Show, and I was, one of the things that's potentially opening up, because I, I understand, like, all of them, especially the American ones, they're trying to reimagine them. You know, they moved Detroit to the summer, long days <laughs> outside. <laughs> Terrible. There's been talk about moving LA Auto Show to, like, SoFi Stadium, the parking lot, or the mezzanine, so you can do some more outdoor stuff. But weirdly, and I think this is, partially because the pandemic had driven some cancellations to the show. There was so much room at L.A. Um, they did some really cool things that you can now do with EVs. You can drive them around oh, inside, inside without right, right, killing right. people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've um, never seen that. Did you go for the F-150 thing? Because I was like, I have never been in a test drive indoors. Right. That's wild. It was super wild. But then also I saw like Ram. And this is this is why I love the truck industry. Those guys just love beating each other up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ram is right next to uh, the Ford uh, booth and they had this running display of actually gas pickup trucks <laughs> going up, like climbing a hill, going over obstacles. And I was like, <laughs> how is this even legal? Yeah. But I think, I think the innovation, the uh, – it's so competitive, just events in general, to get people out there and make it, make it uh, fun – I mean the the levels of swag at these at these shows now are are off the chain, you know. Like, I'm just gonna I'll give you the counterpoint though. I went to the Munich show, which is now actually called the Munich Mobility Show or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they stole it from Frankfurt. Uh, the the Frankfurt mayor messed up. There was about nine cars total at mm-hmm. the show. Porsche didn't even have a booth. Um, there was 1,500 bicycles. I mean, electric bicycles, but right. well, you know, it's just a bicycle. So I, I was like, well, I would I'll never go back. Like, there's no point. I'm just in it for the cars, you know. I like and I the like frequent flyer miles. No, nah, I got enough of those. <laughs> How many more of those do you need? So, <laughs> anyways, Kristen Lee, this has been really fun. Uh, my my Ford Fiesta ST just blew up, uh, no engine. So if you want that for uh, put an EV in there, EV motor in there, let me know. We can talk. That's Pro- a good chassis. It's probably yeah, it's a great chassis. It's probably up for sale very soon. Yes, it was a pleasure having you. Uh, it was great to meet you virtually via Zoom. Hope we can uh, meet up in person. Thank you so much for joining us on our Inevitable podcast. Uh, pleasure talking to you. And we're going to have you back. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure.